Hello all. The big blue green lump on the left there is my new spiral cutter planar thicknesser. Used a fair few thicknesses over the years, all big three phase machines, but this is the first 240 volt spiral one I've used and the first I can call my own, discounting my portable thickness attachment for my Bosch hand planer of course. So this model is the Baby iTech, the 260S from Scott and Sargent. I'll give you a good look around the machine, some pointers on setup, as well as some use and my initial thoughts after having it a week or so. For kickoff, all the beds are cast iron, outfeed, infeed and thicknessing. If I move the guard arm out of the way, you can see there's also a fair bit of cast iron in the base too for carrying the cutter block, rollers and hinges round the back. The rest of the body is folded steel. Brings the machine in at a svelte 176 kilos or so. The guard arm is pretty typical of machines here in the UK and Europe where the guard slides horizontally over the cutter block and has a sprung height adjustment at the rear. If I quickly change tops here a minute, I can show you something I quite like with this guard arm. A simple thing, but you can lock it out of the way just straight behind the outfeed table or down toward the floor. Not unique, but many I've seen either have to be removed out of the way or if they swivel right out of the way toward the floor, they don't lock there. So I like this. Switching back to my red t-shirt, I can tell you the fence is well built if a typical design for this price point. The fence itself is a very substantial piece of alley extrusion. When loosened, there's play in the end caps so you can dial them in when you've squared your fence. The fence sits off the tables by about 3mm. The end caps have a little overhang that you can set to rest on the outfeed and infeed at zero to act as a bearer, adding more support to the fence. Nice touch. If I slide the fence out, you can see it dovetails into its mount and tightens with an adjustable locking lever. The mount appears to be steel, with the sliding part on the fence more cast iron. The fence has a pretty typical and typically annoying mechanism for providing a bevel angle. When loosened, I found the best method is to take no prisoners and go from its 90 position, lift up, then push down. Trying to baby it into position leads to a lot of frustration. It's like the designers know this, so to help you drop into a 45 degree angle, the tough plastic end caps, if you set them right, do give you a 45 degree edge to bear against on the tables. Any angle between that, well, if you have the patience, anything's possible. There's the usual nut on the back of the fence to act as a 90 degree stop, but these mechanisms do warrant you double checking with a square in my experience. All your controls are where you'd expect. Stop start on the front, emergency stop and thickness controls under the outfeed table. The arm for adjusting the infeed cut depth is nice and long which I quite like. Pretty much identical mechanism to that on the Jet 260s. Smooth and easy going. I might put a slightly bigger locking knob on it though. On to pretty much the main reason for me choosing this machine over its only real competitor, the Axminster Trade AT260 SPT, and that is the ease of swapping over from planing to thicknessing. You just undo a locking lever under each table, pull them out a little, and lift both tables as one piece. No need to remove the fence or the guard arm like you do on some machines. Everything can stay in place, then you just flip over the extraction hood and you're ready for thicknessing. This was a big plus for me. With the tables up, hopefully you can see a bit more clearly where the cast iron pieces are and where the folded steel starts. Business end of the machine then, again much as you'd expect. You have a row of metal anti-kickback teeth, a metal corrugated infeed roller for grabbing the workpiece, a 255mm spiral cutter block with 63 15x15mm carbide cutters, and a smooth metal, looks to be stainless, outfeed roller so as to not mark your work after cutting. The last bar you can see with a little grub screw in the centre is just the support to catch the extraction hood tab. There's a support leg under the infeed table to stop them from dropping when raised for thicknessing. A slight pull in the centre releases it. There are springs left and right that do a good job of minimising the weight of lifting or lowering the tables. Nothing unusual there. The two big silver bolts under each table are for locking down. They go through these holes in the cast iron, through which you can see where the locking lever engages. You can see hopefully these are eccentric at the end. Let's talk about setup a bit. That's right, you are going to have to level the beds on this machine and if it's anything like mine, you'll need to set yourself a day or so aside just for this. First step then is to check the back corner nearest the mouth to the outermost cutter at the back of the block. Use a metal rule or flat piece of stock and check the blade moves the rule no more than 5mm. This will give you a datum by which to set everything else. Mine wasn't catching at all, which I thought was going to be an issue as the back or hinge side of the outfeed table has factory set locating pins which you can see here. 
Thankfully, there is a fraction of a millimetre play in the locating pins, so undoing the two bolts nearest the block, that fraction meant the inside corner did eventually catch the cutter, giving a 4mm drag on the rule. If you needed more play for adjustment than that, you'd have to remove the table from its hinge and grind off one of the locating pins holding you back. But it seems a fractional adjustment goes a long way here, so you shouldn't need to. For near side table adjustment, there are two grub screws per table, locked with a nut from above. To access the top of these for adjustment, you'll need to take the front covers off. This is three pieces, a wing on each table if you like, with a centre joining piece that also serves as a cover for the mortising attachment arbor. To remove each wing, you have to unscrew the handles, the two screws on the top and the two screws below the handle. The two screws below the handle have nuts on the rear. Be aware that if you undo all the fixings on the wing covers, the centre piece will drop if you're not ready for it. The in-feed table hinge side adjustment is done via six grub screws on the bracket. These allow you to manipulate the hinge pin. Two grub screws below, two above, and two at the rear. Six grub screws might sound complex or a pain, but I actually found this the easiest to dial in and set. There's adjustment screws for the in-feed table depth adjuster too. The screw behind the bar is a zero stop, the one in front a max depth stop. Max depth is said to be 3mm, but yeah, don't do that. This is a one horsepower, 2000 watt machine. You don't really want to be pushing 3mm cuts with it. It'll do it or your work no good. I've already set my max depth to 1.5mm, no accidental mashing. Something to be aware of before we move on regarding the cover plates at the front of the machine. When you fit your final cover, the in-feed wing in my case here, it's advisable to slip it on in place, then tighten the table down. Fit the handle via its allen bolts, leaving them loose, then do the same with the top screws. Then unlock and lift the tables, they'll both be joined now, even with the loose screws, and loosely fit the screws with the nut under the handle. Tighten the tables back down, then tighten the handle bolts and top screws. Finally, lift the tables again to tighten the screws under the handle with the nuts. This might seem a chore, but fitting the last plate without your tables locked in place can distort and undo all the adjustments you've made to the table. I've taken the cover off the back of the machine so you can have a look inside. Easy to do with just three screws on each side. It uses a standard V-belt for drive. The feed rollers are driven by a large reducing flywheel type thing. If I engage it, you can see it makes contact with the shaft of the cutter block. Simple but effective. Interesting to note that although this is a 16 amp machine, the blurb on the motor rates it at 9.5 amps. I guess it may peak a little higher on startup or under high load. Just behind the motor is the column for the thickness table. Easy enough to get to for periodic lubing. A quick look at the thicknessing end then. All the usual gubbins. You've got a nice, easy to spin hand wheel to adjust the table height. This comes as standard with a digital readout just behind the wheel. The locking lever for the table immediately to its left. And a steel rule depth gauge to its right. There's a little adjustment in the rule and adjustment in the digital readout to dial them in to match actual thickness. On the left, toward the back of the machine, is a lever to engage the rollers for thicknessing, with the emergency stop just below it, the type you rotate to release once pressed. So, sold as a 260 machine, the implication is 260mm cut width. Not so. The infeed and outfeed beds are about 255mm wide, with the extreme edges of the cutters on the block a smidge over 250mm. The thickness bed is around 246mm wide. To add to that, with the fence fully back, you lose about 5mm off the table width. The guard fully back also robs you of a few millimetre, so with both in place, you're realistically looking at just over 240mm above and below. I don't mind that, but if you're to invest in one, you need to know this stuff really. The thickness of bottoms out at around 185mm too. Aimed at light professional use or the serious home user, it's worth talking about power. This is rated as a 16 amp machine. Despite being told the machine didn't actually come with a plug, it did. The standard blue 16 amp kind. I think the cable on the machine is around 1.5 to 2 meters long. As such, I made a 3 meter extension. So, as I rent, there's little I could do to change the electrics in my garage. The least invasive option for me was to take off the original standard double socket, copy the holes in the back of my double 16 amp socket box, and use the original fixings in the wall. The left socket has the extension I made with the thickness are attached, the right has a 16 amp to double standard socket for all my other kit. 
On the advice of an electrician buddy, I swapped out the standard B16 MCB in the consumer unit for a C16. C16s are meant for commercial use and apparently are less sensitive to tripping under peak loads. Took some finding but my obsolete Square D brand are replaced by the Schneider Easies. All this is obviously easily reversed back to normal should I rent or buy somewhere else. Talking of extraction, this is what I picked up, a Charnwood W696. It's 750 watt, so no giant, but performs pretty well with the small chips from the spiral block. I quite like the rolling base, but the machine is pretty basic. This isn't a machine you can have running all day either. Two hours is recommended continuous run time. I can believe that too, as I've noticed even after 40 minutes to an hour, the motor is really hot. Not really an issue for me, but there you are. Also, I initially liked that it came with a hose. However, it's the collapsible stuff and is complete garbage. Nightmare to fit to the outlets. So much so, I had to cut a slit in the ends. I'll get some proper PU stuff at some point. Always good to know what extra bits you get with the machine. With this, you get some feet, a push block and a tool kit. You also get a couple of eyelets, which can be inserted either side of the machine to lift it with a hoist if you have one. Much more useful would be to have some handles around the body of the machine, I think. You're not supposed to lift these machines by the tables, and for good reason. Handles on the main body would help. Thankfully, I was able to use my Jedi powers to lower it from the pallets onto a car. Of course, you also get an instruction booklet, which, apart from the exploded diagram, is pretty useless. The main tutorial in it is how to set the knives on the cutter block, which this doesn't have. In fairness, I was wondering for ages what this screw hanging out the side was. The destruction booklet informed me it's there purely to hang your push block on, and there it will stay, unused for all time. So the spiral cutter, no knife setting needed. The cutters just seat where they seat, 63 of them in all. By all accounts, they last ages, and can be turned so all four sides can be used. But when they need replacing, you're going to be looking at about 190 quid for a set. These blocks are also apparently quiet, which is good for me with neighbours, accommodating, but close. They're also supposed to be better for knots and pippy wood as well as crossed grain stuff. Ideal for my tabletops was my thinking. Another thing I've heard is that they can be stubborn to loosen, to turn or replace, often needing some serious shock therapy. I haven't tried, but a periodic WD-40 spray between uses might help with this. Let's do a test of this quietness. Got the phone with Bosch's INVH sound meter app about one meter away from the machine. The top left box is the active measured sound the average to the right of it. Just realised there's one of my top secret designs on the pad there, damn. Anyways, about 73.5 dB, eh, it's pretty quiet. Here the phone is on my stall, between the planer and the extractor, one metre from both for a combined level. With both machines running, we read around 79 dB. Lastly, I'm back on the bench. Should have kept it on the stall, really, as it's now a bit further from the extractor. But anyway, here I'll measure the extra noise from the machine when cutting. A piece of 120mm wide oak was the victim. I'd call that about 79 to 80 dB. Again, that's pretty quiet. This makes it easily the quietest process in my workshop using machines. As a side note, I may not have bought the Axminster machine, but I did buy some of their deodorant. Long lasting, with a machine must, that will surely turn beta to alpha, metrosexual to lumbosexual, letting everybody know you're all about that smooth, smooth iron. Wipe on, buff off, get wood. Here I have some wood, some oak, to give you some sort of look at the machine in action. Three or four passes to take the twist out of it, this block gives a lovely finish on the oak, very even, no marks and with a slight sheen on the surface. No discernible flex in the fence at all and jointing, it's a good height too, very reassuring to use. Here's the obligatory close up shot of the cutter in action, set to 1.5mm here. And this gives a nice clean square edge along the length. Thought I'd give this small piece of purple heart a go, firstly to see what it's like with a fairly hard hardwood, and secondly to see how the thickness rollers handle a small piece like this. I'll clean up the two sides with bandsaw and table saw marks first.
cut through it like batter. You'll notice the sides go from purple to brown when cut. Soon purple's up again though. Time for a bit of thicknessing then. Doesn't have a gobsmacking feed speed this machine. About 4.8 meters a minute. Perhaps it's a good thing though. I've planed and thicknessed some 200mm white beech recently. 1mm cut and it didn't strain at all. No discernible change in blade speed or tone. You might have noticed I tend to set the work close to me when planing and feed in from the left side of the bed when thicknessing. It's the way I like to use these machines and spreads the wear on the blades a bit. Let's see if it'll feed this 170mm long bit of purple heart through okay. No problemo. I think as long as your piece is no shorter than the distance between the rollers, you're fine. So I thought I'd show you the chip size. They're very small little curls. These were from the 1.5mm close-up jointing pass you saw earlier. I should note I found extraction on thickness mode excellent. Really good. Clears almost everything. In planing mode, it seems to be somewhere near, I don't know, 80%. Here's some through and through cut sycamore I sent through the machine. These are about a year old. Still a bit green, but like the elm in the back, is quite figured and with knots etc. Good test of the cutter block I thought. It's done a nice job, but my mind isn't blown by the spiral cutter's abilities on figured wood. Don't get me wrong, some of this elm as you can see is difficult, but there is still some very slight furring in spots where grain drastically changes direction around a knot. This might improve as the wood ages a little and dries more. Still good results though, and an improvement over straight knives I think. This piece for example, where one limb met another, very difficult to plane, but it's done quite a nice job. Only one little spot with some furring that a few strokes with 180 grit would remedy. The finish on properly dry stock with fairly straight grain, like this oak, is very nice, and would take very little to finish. Seems to leave surfaces with a subtle sheen. I've experienced no snipe either. All the pieces are clean, end to end. No furring around the knots in this oak either. I suspect due to it being properly dried. As you can see, the purple heart has purpled again. It, like all the other pieces, came out quite uniform from the thicknesser over their length too. No more than a tenth or so deviation, according to my quick checks with the verniers. I think I'm going to more or less wrap it up about there. My initial impression is that it's a decent machine. Everything is there to achieve great results. You just have to put in a bit of time to set it up. I shouldn't let that put you off. Someone recently said to me on Instagram that they'd probably go for the Axminster so they don't have to set it up. But you do. The Woodgrafters video on it are a testament to that. Likewise, the Charnwood and Record Power machines in this £1,000 to £2,000 price bracket. You're going to have to spend some time to align the beds properly. And don't let other YouTubers fool you. It's not a five minute job. It's a pain in the nethers. But it is rewarding once set though. Stick with it. Phone the supplier if you need to for advice. And get those tables level. As I know some will ask, this machine cost me a little over £1,800. I got it from Scott and Sargent, iTech's only UK dealer I think. They do PDI checks on the machines before dispatch, but quite what's involved in that I've no idea. Literally everything was out on my machine, so I assume it's nothing more than an electrical test. Scott and Sargent do have a short video on dialing in the planer beds. It's not in depth, but enough to go off so you can get the job done. I'll link it below. I'll do my best to answer any questions if you have them below. And as always, if you've made it this far, thanks for watching.